The amazing thing about being diagnosed with cancer is that all of a sudden you have a very defined conflict in your life. You have a, a very defined struggle and difficulty <laughs> and, and suffering. You have suffering in your life. And those are things that are missing from a whole lot of people's lives in North America. And it, and it forces you to live a story, to live a different story. In real stories, there's so many different plot lines and things happening at once, it's very difficult to categorize them into different phases. But the classical five-phase story structure is sometimes a good place to start to help survivors to view their cancer journey as a story. Five phases of a story are exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. Typically, the cancer journey starts out with someone living their life, either enjoying it or hating it. I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was a normal phase because I was 18. I was just tired. I was exhausted, and so I, got, I was getting into fights with my mom all the time. All the time, and said to her, "I said I don't want to move out. I don't want to leave things the way they are. What do you want me to do?" And she goes, "Like Christine, I'd really like you to go to the doctors." And I said, "Okay, I can do that. That's simple." And so I went to the doctors, and she. My doctor just said, oh, it's your antidepressants, just increase your dose. I had a little summer gig riding a bike downtown Vancouver. It's kind of like a messenger. It was end of June, I guess, I started noticing heavy symptoms. Very off balance and dizzy, which was trouble riding a bike, especially when you're just trying to weave between people's side mirrors at intersections and stuff, right? Uh, before I was diagnosed, I was working in a restaurant and I wasn't really, I didn't really know what I wanted. I, I knew I wanted to go back to school, but I, I had no clue what direction I was going in. The introduction of the conflict is the diagnosis of cancer, and the rising action is all the initial struggles and difficulties around the cancer diagnosis and getting into treatments and things like that. So I told my mom, I'm going to see a blood specialist at the oncology unit at Oshawa. So I remember driving home that night in the car, and I remember exactly where we were, and we were turning. And I said, there's no way I have leukemia. There's no way. Like, that's just impossible. That just sounded so funny to me at the time. When we got home, within an hour or two, the doctor called and talked to my mom on the phone, and then my mom handed me the phone, and. They told me that I had uh, leukemia. I was uh, misdiagnosed by five different doctors. I had a brain tumor growing, and it had split whatever the skin is to your brain, so I was bleeding to the brain, and I guess I was hemorrhaging. And I guess right about then, they called the ambulance. Got me in under a scan, though, and uh, within the hour, they had me from Langley to New West and under the knife. Or so they say, I tell everyone that story, right? So when I finally got my ultrasound, basically the pathologists came out and say, you have to stay here to do a mammogram. And then she say, next week, um, you get the earliest biopsy appointment. Um, and then everything just kept rolling like that. And of course, finally, it was um, came out to be cancer. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in December 2009. I was 21. It was pretty scary to have to spend a month in a hospital when I'd not even spent a night. The climax moment is usually a decision that that person makes that I'm not going to be angry or bitter or disillusioned anymore. I'm going to look at this cancer and deal with it in a way um, that it adds something to my life instead of taking away from my life. Had my portacath in, I got it put in in April of 2006. And at the ACRA retreat, I, I had been holding on to it because I was afraid if I got it out that, um, that it was a way of the cancer coming back. Am I the hand you'll choose to fold? 
And at the ACK retreat, I realized that I had, that's when I realized that I had let the cancer define who I really was, and that needed to stop. And the first thing I thought of was the portacath is holding me back, is keeping me from, like, if I can take that out, that's a piece of me that's, that's gone from that, and it doesn't, it's not all of me, it's just a piece that I don't need anymore. The one thing that we don't need, one thing that's holding us back. So that's what this candle represents. Um, and God's it. silent voice Saying yes, no, yes, no, maybe yes Saying yes, no, yes, no feel like I'm really, I'm about to make some sort, I don't know what it is, but I'm about to make some sort of decision. It's just, I, I never really felt like I, I don't know, almost had a purpose, you know? So, but now I feel like I want to have some impact on life or some, my life, someone's life. I want to have a life with meaning, not just a going through the motions, doing what I think I should be doing. Leave the girl that I adore and trust someone who can love her more Do I have the means to make such a choice? And then Typically, the falling action phase is once they've made that decision, things go even worse. <laughs> and they start to feel like they were stupid for making that type of decision or stupid for trying to view things that way. Um, it's where friends and family fall away. It's usually where all the difficulties, the major amount of difficulties in a cancer journey occur. I would say the post-treatment challenges are definitely more difficult than the treatment itself. The post-treatment is getting back to life. Um, when people might expect you to be back to your normal, like when you, your life and your mentality is forever changed. Like I wouldn't leave the house for like a week, you know what I mean? And that would bother my family or, you know, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't say anything and they would just say, oh, you never did anything today. <laughs> I was, just could sense their disappointment. I don't find that I can get over my fears as easily as I used to be able to. And I believe that it's, it, um, can't even think of the word, it stops me from moving on. It's usually just a moment of letting go and just being like, you know what, this is, this is what it is and I'm just gonna leave it there. And once that letting go has occurred, that's usually the final, um, conflict, um, then the resolution occurs and they're able to come through this cancer thing in a completely different place. And this is true whether they are cured or not. Um, it's, it's often the same. Like, no, I've, I've been through a, a valley of in, like, no, depression, sort of feel sorry for myself and being a victim of cancer, that I sort of, I felt that I've got out of that valley. I feel more motivated to, to being with, like, you know, being loved and to love someone, um, and to be gentle to myself and, and not caring about rewards or accomplishments. I just, it was kind of like cancer made me a better, I feel like I'm a better person because of it. Even though it's, you don't want to say that, it's, it's kind of how it is. <laughs> it kind of sucks, but it's, it's the truth. I did, it's, it's, it was kind of a blessing in disguise, but I look back and I am much happier being the way I am now than who I was then, because I wasn't happy then.
The interesting thing that we have discovered through listening to hundreds of cancer stories is that resolution does not necessarily come with remission. The resolution of a cancer journey really starts when a person touched by cancer begins to follow through on the decision they made to not let cancer define them. The reason I'm so passionate about getting survivors to tell their stories is because through telling their stories, they can give others hope. Telling that story allows other people to, show, to see that, you know what, maybe I won't always be this angry, or maybe I won't always be this bitter, or maybe I won't always be this frustrated with my life. There's, there's an opportunity for movement there, and that gives people hope. I send songs through the cold air, through the cold stagnant air. I sing of love, but then I leave it there. I choose to leave my. 